You are now tuned in to the Addicted to Success.com podcast, where geniuses, entrepreneurs, and next level game changers share their juicy little secrets on achieving massive success. This is the advice you wish you heard years ago. Be prepared and take note as we expose the realness and the raw of what it takes to be successful on Addicted to Success.com. Now, before we get into this interview, I have an exclusive opportunity for you that I'd love to bring to your attention. And that is I have just launched a six to 12 month mastermind called the Circle of Influence, where I'll be taking you under my wing to show you how to build a platform online that generates an income for you so you can have more freedom in your life. I'm also going to show you how to become a powerful influencer online so that you can score interviews and so you can get exposure on major publications and platforms. And I'm going to even show you how to build these platforms yourself such as a website a podcast a youtube channel and at social media following so that you can get your message out there to millions i'm also going to show you how to network with other incredible leaders online so that you can interview them and so that you can collaborate with them and really show you how to refine your story so you can share it in an unforgettable way to score more interviews to score book deals and to gain more speaking opportunities so that you can become a powerhouse leader. Now, if this speaks to you, make sure you head over to imjoelbrown.com slash apply and get in before I close my doors on this live interactive exclusive opportunity where I'm going to go deep with you and with the community of Circle of Influence Game Changers. Don't miss this. Now, let's get into this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. I'm your host, Joel Brown, and I'm here today with James Clear, who is a returning guest. Uh, We had James on a good two years ago, and his episode absolutely rocked. It still gets thousands upon thousands of downloads uh, every month here with Addicted to Success. So James has just released a book called Atomic Habits, and the thing that I really love about James is the fact that He doesn't just go and get some textbook stuff. He actually implements this in his life. He tests it. He fine tunes it. He researches and studies and creates his own unique concepts when it comes to behavior change. So James, I'm excited for you to jump in with us and share how we can implement atomic habits in our life. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited to be back and chatting with you. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Wonderful. So James, I, I was serious about that first comment about jumping in and fine tuning and testing and tweaking. Can you share with us real quick, for those that are also maybe coaches, speakers, uh, experts in their field, how can we uh, really jump in and fine tune our processes? What's your process that you go through when it comes to uh, creating exercises and discovering new ways of behavior change and personal change? Mm. Well, uh, so I think broadly is the place to start. You need to read widely. Uh, so I, I like to say that I'm idea agnostic. And what I mean by that is I don't care where an idea comes from. Uh, it can be biology, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, um, whatever field it comes from, it's fine with me as long as it's a good idea and that it's practical and actionable. And so I kind of view my job as to, to read widely and then be a bridge between the academic research and the scientific research and uh, take that knowledge and make it practical. And so in a lot of ways, that's what I'm trying to do when I'm writing. And uh, when I worked on Atomic Habits, to bring this to the system that I use for building better habits, I th- one of the core themes of the book is that you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And so uh, the one of the purposes of building Atomic Habits or writing that book was to come up with a system that people could follow for implementing and building better habits. Um, and, uh, and so I think I was able to do that. Uh, and, uh, the book is built around what I call the four laws of behavior change. And those are sort of the, the elements of that system for building better habits. Oh, I love it, man. That's funny. You know, I, a lot of people that I coach, uh, I have coaches that come to me and they say they're like a mindset coach or they're a health coach. And I ask them, well, what makes you different? And they say, oh, well, I, you know, I like this. I'm passionate about that. I say, okay, but when people come to you, what's your system? And so I love that you have this system within your book that like when people can read it, if they follow every step, there's no way that they can't get results in their life, right? Now, when it comes to habits or habit implementation, where do you see people going wrong? Hmm. Well, 
So the reason that I chose the phrase atomic habits is that the word atomic can have multiple meanings. So for example, first, uh, an atom is very tiny and small. So, and that's like part of my system is that I think habits should be small and easy to do. Um, the second meaning of the word atomic is that it's like the, the fundamental unit of a larger system. So atoms build into molecules, molecules build into compounds and so on. And similarly, uh, I don't think that people need to make just one little change and then they'll see their life transform. The, the holy grail of habit change is to have like a thousand one percent improvements and just kind of layer them all on top of each other. There's little, small, easy habits that you build each day and they're all organized towards a single goal. And that's how you get a system, uh, a bunch of fundamental units working towards things. And in a sense, I think we could say that habits are kind of like the atoms of our lives. You know, like an atom is the fundamental unit of a larger system. A habit is like the fundamental or uh, unit or behavior, the l patterns and rituals that you perform each day. And when you put them all together, you end up with the system of your life. And then the third meaning of atomic is that it's the source of immense energy or power. And I think that that kind of gives you the arc of the book, which is if you make these small changes and you layer them into a system, then you can get some remarkable results or some powerful results at the end of it. And your question was, where do people go wrong? And I think that the answer is hidden kind of in that phrase, atomic habits. There are two main mistakes that people make. The first is people have heard things like take small steps or start small or something like that. But even when you know that you should start small, it's still easy to start way too big. Um, so that's the first mistake is starting too large. The second mistake is making one change and working for a month or six months or whatever, and then getting frustrated that you haven't seen the results yet and giving up at that point. So it's rather than making one change, we need to make a variety of 1% changes and layer them on top of each other. And the way that I like to, the metaphor that I use in the book for this is it's kind of like the process of heating up an ice cube, you know, like you're. You're in a room, it's cold, you can see your breath, the ice cube sitting on the table, and you start to heat the room up one degree at a time. And you're getting closer and closer. You heat it up, you know, two, three, four degrees. Still, the ice cube is melted. It's still, or still it's uh, frozen. It's still sitting there. But then at some point, you heat it up one more degree, a one degree shift, just like all the others, and uh, you get this phase transition. The ice cube melts. And a lot of the time, the process of habit change and behavior change and really performance improvement in any area is kind of like the process of heating up an ice cube. You know, like people get people get upset that they work for a couple months and don't see results. But the work was not wasted. It's just stored just as the same way the heat was stored as you're heating up that ice cube. You just need to get to a point where you can cross that that threshold and unleash that latent potential. So I would say the two mistakes that people make, the first one is starting too big. And the second one is uh, giving up too soon. Wow, I love that breakdown. The, the ice cube analogy is, is awesome. It paints a very clear picture. So James, can you give us just an example of where you've implemented uh, your system and your processes in your life so that those mm -hmm. that are listening, if they're feeling like they're on a similar track to you, how can they do it too? Yeah, so let me give you two examples. Um, so the, the four laws of behavior change, which I lay out in the book, are the first law is to make it obvious. The second law is to make it attractive. The third law is to make it easy. And the fourth law is to make it satisfying. And each one of those four is linked to uh, part of the neurological feedback loop of how habits form. So there are four stages in that loop, and each law is linked to one of those four. Um, the book goes into that in more detail. We don't need to cover it right now. But, okay, how did I actually apply that in my life? So there are two, two examples here. The first one is um, – Let's pick a habit that I uh, struggled to build for a while. So flossing um, for many years, I would brush my teeth twice a day, but I wouldn't floss consistently. And one of the ways that I was able to do that was by mapping out the chain of behaviors that happened each uh, each time I did that. So, you know, I looked around, I was like, all right, what needs to happen for me to floss? OK, first, I need to take the floss out of the drawer in the bathroom. Sometimes I don't remember to do that because it's hidden. It's in the drawer. I don't see it. It's not obvious. The second thing that I didn't like about the process, and it sounds kind of silly, but I didn't like wrapping the floss around my fingers. It was just like uncomfortable. Um, so I bought some of the pre-made flossers and I got a little bowl and I put the flossers in it right next to the toothbrush. And uh, that was pretty much all I needed to do to build that habit. Now I brush my teeth, I put the toothbrush down, I pick a flosser up and I do it right there. And the two laws, the behavior change that I used there were make it obvious. So rather than having it tucked away in the drawer, it's now obvious on the counter and make it easy. Uh, and so I reduce the friction of the, you know, winding it around my fingers and taking more time to, to pull the floss out by buying the pre-made flosser. All right. So that's a positive example of building a good habit. 
So let's say that you want to use the loss to break a bad habit. Um, a lot of people feel like they watch too much TV or play too many video games or watch Netflix too much or um, you just spend generally too much time on the screen. But if you walk into pretty much any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face? They all face the television. So it's kind of like, what is this room designed to get you to do? It's designed to get you to watch TV. So there are varying degrees of, uh, of actions that you could take here. You could move one chair so that it doesn't face the television anymore. You could take the remote control and take it like off the uh, coffee table and put it in a drawer uh, or uh, in a desk or something. You could take the television and put it inside a wall unit or a cabinet so that you don't see it as often. And all of those are examples of the inversion of the first law. So to build a good habit, I said the first law is to make it obvious. To break a bad habit, you want to do the opposite. You want to make it invisible. Um, so uh, that's a way to make seeing the television or seeing the cues that prompt you to perform the habit less visible. The second thing that you can do is increase friction. So remember, the third law for building a good habit was to make it easy. Now, if you invert it, you want to make it difficult. So if you want to watch less TV, uh, you could take the batteries out of the remote, for example. And now each time you need to watch TV, you have to. it takes you an extra five or ten seconds. And maybe that's enough time for you to think, do I really want to watch something or am I just like mindlessly turning it on right now? Or you could unplug the television after each individual use and then only plug it back in if you can say the name of the show that you want to watch. So you're not allowed to just like turn Netflix on and browse it mindlessly. Um, if you really wanted to be extreme about it, you could take the TV off the wall, put it in the closet, and then like only take it out when you, had, when you wanted to watch something and it was so good that you were like, okay, I need to set the TV up again. But the point here is that to, to break bad habits, you want to increase the friction associated with the task. You want to increase the amount of steps between you and the bad behavior. And to build good habits, you want to reduce the friction. You want to reduce the number of steps. And so that's how you can use either make it easy, the third law, to build a good habit, or make it difficult, the inversion of the third law, to break a bad one. And uh, those are kind of two good examples that showcase how those laws can be applied in daily contexts. And you can sort of think of each of the four laws as like levers. And when the levers are in the right positions, building good habits is very easy. And when they're in the wrong positions, it's really hard. Um, and so really the levers are like, uh, or the laws are kind of like a toolkit and you can just pull out the right tool based on the habit that you're facing. Wow. I love this. Absolutely love this. Uh, it sounds like, uh, it's, it's, heavily based off the structures that are around you, right? Like looking at the structures that you have set up in your day. So that's definitely true. Uh, the examples that I just gave are really heavily dependent on like the physical environment uh, for the that first and third law. But the principles apply across contexts. So, for example, you can do the same thing in the digital environment. Um, you know, like for my uh, for my phone, I have noticed that if something is obvious on the phone, that I'm going to be more likely to fall into it, which is exactly what you would think based on the first law. The more obvious it is, the easier the habit is to do. So uh, I do the same thing with my icons where I move like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of that off of the home screen. They're actually two swipes over and then nested inside the folder. And it's just a little bit of additional friction. But the point is I don't want to open up my phone and just tap Instagram just because it's there, right? Just because and without thinking about it. I want it to be a more conscious choice. Um, and you can do the same thing with, uh, you know, with your computer desktop or things like that. And uh, some of the social media sites, the blockers, the website blockers, those are that's just a way of increasing friction, right? You're you're just uh, increasing the amount of effort that is required to go to that um, to go to that site. So, um, yeah, there there are ways for those to be applied across contexts. And then there are other things outside of the physical environment that influence habits, but those have more to do with some of the other laws. Right. Beautiful. James, have you ever had a look at, do you, do you have an iPhone, an Apple iPhone? Yeah. Have you ever had a look in this section here? I'll show you. And for those that are listening, follow the steps. You go to your iPhone, right? If you have one and you click settings, you can go down to battery. Okay. And it shows you your battery usage. And what's really interesting is it'll show at the top here for me, 49% of my battery usage over the last 24 hours has been Instagram. It runs mm -hmm. in the background. I haven't shut it down but it shows you what your activity is based off time. So there's a little clock in the right, on the right hand side, you can go oh, last. Oh, that's fascinating, I didn't know the last, time was there. Yeah, it's crazy, last seven days, click the little clock, and it tells me that over the last seven days, I spent 15.2 hours on screen time, 42 minutes background time on Instagram. It's wow. crazy, man. One time, when my friend showed me this, 
I, I the first time I did it, I, I looked, and over the last seven days, I'd spent twenty three point four hours on Instagram, and I felt sick in my stomach, man, because I was like, oh you no, you spent been... one day out of your last week. On Absolutely, Instagram. and I lost, and then I went back and looked at my Instagram, like looked at my uh, profile and the interaction, and I just couldn't see, like it, I just couldn't justify like the time that I spent, I looked at it, I was like, I just didn't, don't see where the return on investment was because I was spending so much time consuming other people's information rather than creating more of my own content. So that was- So this is actually a really deep lesson about habits and behavior in general, which is that uh, humans are forming habits all the time. In many ways, your habits are just like the, uh, they're the solutions that your brain comes up with to the problems that recur in your life. So when you face the same problem or the same feeling over and over again, your brain develops a solution for it and eventually those solutions become habits. But as I just played out with these four laws of behavior change, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. If a solution is more satisfying or more easy or more obvious, then you're gonna be more likely to opt for that solution. And because we carry our phones around with us all the time, Social media is one of the least friction uh, heavy. It's one of the most frivolous behaviors in our lives. And so we often find ourselves opting for it to solve these problems of I'm feeling bored or I'm feeling stressed or something like that, uh, rather than something else that might be more fruitful, but isn't quite as frictionless. Um, and so what you need to do is try to change the, the balance of the equation and make social media more, uh, add the, add some friction, make it less obvious so that you can opt for something else instead. And some of those little strategies, like we mentioned, like moving the icons over and blocking websites and things like that help you in that kind of pursuit. Oh uh, yeah. That's some great advice. Thank you, James. Uh, James, in your pursuit of really, uh, finding ways to implement great habits, were there any other elements that aren't habit based that you feel like we could bring into our lives? Like, is there anything around beliefs, anything around skill acquisition? So there are quite a few things that influence, I mean, habits are a backbone of our lives. And so there are a lot of things that influence them in some way. One of the most meaningful ones is, uh, is identity and the beliefs that you bring in to, uh, to each kind of moment and how those shape your, your habits. And the way to think about this is that it's the link between identity and habits is kind of like a feedback loop. So they, they influence each other. It's like a two way street. And, um, early on, as you start to repeat experiences, it's like each moment in life casts a vote for the type of person that you think that you are. And so, uh, if you do something once, you know, if you, um, if you sit down to write a poem one time, you don't consider yourself a poet, but if you do it, as a habit week in and week out, then at some point you kind of cross this invisible threshold and you're like, Oh, I guess I'm a writer now. Uh, same thing, you know, you can like go play rugby once or twice. And it's just like, well, I just played the sport once, but if you do it every week, then you're like, I guess I'm a rugby player. So, uh, the way to think about this is that your habits are the way that you embody a particular identity. So every time you make your bed, you embody the identity of someone who is neat and organized. Um, every time you, go to the gym, you embody the identity of someone who is fit. Every time you uh, sit down to write, you embody the identity of someone who is a writer. And so the more that you repeat these behaviors, the more you start to believe things about yourself. And I think this is an important distinction to make because it's a little bit different than what sometimes people will say things like fake it till you make it. But fake it till you make it is actually asking you to believe something that you don't have evidence for. And habits are exactly the opposite. They are each time you do it, you provide evidence that you are that type of thing. And so as you build up evidence, you have a reason to continue to believe that about yourself. And I think that this is actually the the deeper meaning behind why habits matter. Habits, it's true. Habits can, you know, help you get in shape or they can help you be more productive or earn more money or meditate and reduce stress. All those things are good. Those are great external results and habits can do that. But I think the reason, the real reason they matter is that they cast these votes for the beliefs that we have about ourselves and the habits that you repeat day in and day out end up shaping your sense of self and what you think about yourself, uh, either consciously or unconsciously. So 
the way to uh, the way to change, the way to upgrade and expand your identity, the way to believe something new about yourself, I think, is by building these small habits and casting these little votes day in and day out and then building up that evidence. And so uh, this, again, comes back to why habits are important and why small habits are meaningful, even if they don't seem to deliver a big outcome in the moment, is that each one casts a vote for, for who you think that you are. Yeah, this is so good. You know, James, I feel like uh, right now, especially with social media, I think a lot of people are really confused as to what their identity really is. You know, they're putting people on pedestals, they're comparing, they are adopting other people's beliefs rather than going, what do I actually really want? Mm. So, you know, one of the challenges of, uh, of our current society in this like social media heavy world is that we are very outcome focused because outcomes and results are the things that are worth uh, that people deem worth sharing. You know, like you're never going to see a news story that is something like man eats chicken and salad for lunch today. You know, you're only going <laughs> to see the story that is like guy loses a hundred pounds six months from now. You know, you never, you only see the result. You never see the process behind the results. And um, again, I think this is one of the reasons that habits are critical because it, the, 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 the outcome of always being inundated with everybody's results on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, through social media, through the news, is that we start to overvalue results and undervalue the process. We start to think that it's actually all about the goal when really it's all about the system or the process. And the uh, the downside of that or the, the thing that's confusing about that is people – People think that you need to achieve these outcomes, but really the outcomes are not the thing that needs to change. So, for example, if you get really motivated and you want to like clean your room, what you think you want is a clean room. But even if you get motivated and do that in the moment, you'll have a clean room for now. But if you don't change like the sloppy or messy habits that led to a clean room, you'll end up or that led to a messy room, you'll end up with a messy room again in a month or two. And so you think what needs to change is the outcome, but actually what needs to change is the habits behind the outcome. And it's kind of like uh, when you're so obsessed with results, people just end up treating symptoms instead of treating the, the cause. And, uh, and I think that in many ways, habits are the cause behind the results that we have. I mean, you, in a lot of ways, you're, whatever your outcomes are in life, you're, they're often a lagging measure of your habits. You know, like your the amount of clutter in your room is a lagging measure of your cleaning habits. The amount of weight on the scale is a lagging measure of your eating habits. The amount of money in your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. And you get what you repeat. And uh, so often people are, are focused on what the outcome is rather than what the process behind it is. Oh, yes, yes. James, we have this uh, saying, actually, my mentor taught me this a long time ago. He said, Everybody sees the glory, but they don't see the story, mm. right? We're so obsessed with that, like how it looks and rather than how did it come to be, you know? And I love that you, yes. you jumped in on that because it's such an important thing is everyone's going for perfect over progress. And the progress is what we should be measuring more than anything. Well, and achieving a goal is only a point in time anyway. So, you know, even if you are, even if you do happen to get a particular result, like I can remember for a long time, I used to think that, oh, if I can just get my business featured in the New York Times, then I'll be set. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had a few years where I was working and, and stuff. And then eventually, recently, the last couple of years, I have been featured there multiple times. And it doesn't do a whole lot. It's a <laughs> spike for like a day or two. And then things go back to normal after a week. Like you need to, you can, you think that you want this thing that'll like set you on a different trajectory. But um, in fact, that is just a moment in time itself. And if you don't continue the habits afterward, then, uh, then you, you know, you don't have the results, um, to stick around. So it's kind of like, it reminds me when a lot of the, one of the most common questions I get is how long does it take to build a habit? And people see things like, Oh, it takes 21 days or it takes 30 days. There's one research study that said it takes 66 days on average. So now that's kind of the number that's going around. But even that number, that was, uh, that was just an average and the, the range was very wide in that study. It was like a couple weeks if it was an easy habit, like drinking water at lunch. And it was a cut like seven or eight months. If it was a hard habit, like going for a run after work. But the, the question itself is kind of, uh, taking the wrong angle because when you ask how long does it take to build a habit, what you're really implying is, okay, how hard do I have to work? And then I can stop. But habits are not a finish line to be crossed, you know, like they're a lifestyle to be lived. And so the honest answer to that is 
how long does it take to build a habit? Well, it takes forever because if you stop doing it, then it's no longer a habit. So I think people need like a shift in perspective and to focus on building a better lifestyle, small changes that you can sustain rather than focusing on a finish line or trying to achieve a result and hoping that that'll solve everything. Yeah, I love that. It's like the uh, each one is like a piece to the puzzle on a picture that never gets finished, right? It's like uh, you're saying that you've got this big thing and it's about to happen and you're so excited and then it passes. You're like, okay, what's next? It's the same thing with me. It's featured in mm. a documentary film, you know, like big podcast episode um, features on other people's channels and you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be huge. And it just comes and goes, comes and goes. So like, what it, what is it that you really want that's here to stay? Like, it's your lifestyle that you build, right? It's like, are you fulfilled? Are you aligned? Are you in flow? They're the moments that you really like take hold of that has this richness to it. Again, this is why the system is more important than the goal, because the goal is just this moment that fleets by. But if you if you make it all about the goal, then you end up boxing yourself into this very narrow version of happiness. Because if you don't achieve the goal, then you feel like a failure. Imagine this. You set a goal to lose like uh, you know 20 pounds or something or 10 kilos, whatever, over the next uh, couple months. And then you don't you like you only lose half that but you feel terrible because you didn't hit this arbitrary goal that you set in the beginning, even though you're making progress and have lost weight. Uh, so you, if you don't hit the goal, you don't feel good. Um, if you hit the goal and then stop there, then you're kind of like, well, maybe I had more in me, but I just stopped at the goal. And then if you blow past the goal, it's like, well, what was, you know, like I, my estimation was wrong to begin with. Um, but so with a goal, you're only happy in this very, it's like this either or scenario, either you achieve your goal and you're satisfied or you don't and you're unsatisfied. But with a system, you can be happy no matter what the outcome is, as long as the system is running, as long as you, it's like the difference between I want to lose a certain amount of weight versus I want to be the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. If you want to foster that identity, uh, then you can be happy anytime you're working out because you're uh, reinforcing that identity. Whereas the other one, you can only be happy if the scale says a particular number. Yeah, oh, that's such, a, such an important distinction. You know, I think we all have systems, right? Just some are more clunky than others. You have a system right now in your life. Everyone that's listening to this right now, you have a system. And it's a good thing to audit it. It's a good thing to fine tune it and check in on it to see like, what are the holes in your system right now? And I love that, you know, James so clearly broke down that the habits are the backbone of your life. It's a backbone of your system. So this is such a great place for anyone that's listening right now to start. Uh, James shared some incredible laws here that he's discovered. Uh, so make sure that you note them down. Go back, listen to the episode again, note them down and start implementing them in your life. Uh, James, you've studied a little bit around uh, the unconscious mind, right? Because that has a big effect. It drives what 90 to 95 percent of our thoughts and our actions from you know I think we think 90 to 95 percent of the same thoughts as the day before. To me, that's scary because I want to. I like to think that I'm creating way more change in my life. Now, what are some other interesting things that you've discovered in your studies of the unconscious mind? So we don't often, we are not con often consciously aware of how heavily society leans on us all. So the um, the second law of behavior change is to make it attractive. And what you find is that the habits and behaviors that are often attractive to you are heavily dependent on the tribes that you are a part of or the cultures and subgroups that you are a part of. So, um, you know, we're all part of large, uh, large cultures. So that could be being part of a nation or, you know, like, let, let's just go through a couple examples. So if you come up to a stop sign, pretty much everybody stops because that's what, uh, the world expects you to do when you get to that, that, uh, moment. Right. If you, um, walk into an elevator, everybody turns around to face the front rather than facing the back. If you have a, an interview, you wear a suit and a tie or a dress or something nice rather than like a bathing suit. There's no reason that you have to do those things. You could wear a bathing suit to a job interview. You could turn around and face the back of the elevator. You could <laughs> run every stop sign. But we don't because it would violate these like shared expectations that the group has. Yeah. And it's true that we're not only part of large tribes, like what it means to be Australian or what it means to be American or what it means to be French. Um, but we're also part of smaller tribes, like what it means to be a part of your local volunteer organization or to be a member of your local CrossFit gym or to be uh, a neighbor that lives on your street. 
And each one of those little subgroups has a set of expectations that it that are associated with its behaviors. And so the key is you want to join groups where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. You know, like if you want to learn how to play uh, a mu um, music and you hang out with a bunch of jazz musicians, then suddenly playing jazz like every week seems super normal because that's what everybody does. Um, there are many people who if you want to get in shape. Going to the gym feels like a sacrifice, feels like effort and work. But there are other people that going to the gym is just what they do every week. It's not it's not a sacrifice for them. It's just part of their normal lifestyle. And so if you can hang out with those groups, it becomes more normal for you to do that as well. The key, though, and I haven't seen many people mention this, the, the caveat to this is the thing that makes you want to stick to group norms is a sense of belonging and friendship. And so you need to feel like you want to be friends with those people because in order to maintain the friendship, you want to stick to the group norm. And so I think the way to do this, if you're joining a tribe for the first time, is find a group where your desired behavior is the normal behavior and you already have something else in common. So the example I like to give is uh, Steve Cam, a friend of mine. He runs a site called Nerd Fitness. And so the site is about getting in shape. But it's also specifically tailored towards people who are identify as nerds, who love Star Wars or who love Batman or the Marvel Universe and comics and all kinds of other nerdy things, programming and languages and stuff like that. And if you if you want to get in shape, often you feel uh, uncomfortable the first time that you go in the gym or you feel out of out of place. But if you can connect with somebody over like your mutual love of Star Wars, then you have an, a, a different reason to be friends and you can build the friendship there. And then as that friendship blossoms, you have another reason to stick with the habit of working out and doing the thing that you were trying to build in the first place. And so, um, as I mentioned, the second law of behavior change is to make it attractive. And what you find is when habits go against the grain of our culture and tribes, they're very unattractive. And when they go with the grain of that, they're very attractive. And so one of the keys to making a habit last and stick in the long run is surrounding yourself with these social norms that are lifting you up rather than pushing you down or hindering you. And often that is a totally unconscious thing. People are not aware of how much they're internalizing the norms of the groups that they're in and how heavily that is shifting their behavior. I absolutely believe that. I think that, you know, I, I got to this point when I started addicted to success where I started disconnecting from the old group of friends and I felt lonely for at least two or three years, to be honest. I was like a lone wolf on this journey, just yeah. like building and and I and I realized like as I built it up and started, uh, I guess representing the the things I valued most, it started attracting people that also valued that too. And I started to step into circles that I'd never stepped into before, and there was this like awesome power behind collaboration I'd never felt before. And this unconsciously, really we all lifted bring, each yeah. other up, right? It was like this slinky effect of like if I'm kind of having a down day. I, I, my, one of my friends is killing it. And so I'm like, whoa, you know, that's possible and vice versa. We do it for each other. It's a, it's a crucial point. And that is that often to leave your old tribe ends up being a very courageous and brave act because you have to go out on your own. And it's much easier to do that if you have a place to go. And so leave, leaving an old tribe is a, in a sense, you're asking people to like abandon their identity, you know, because they have previously identified as imagine someone who leaves a religion. If you previously identified as Christian and you decide to become Buddhist, that in a sense, that's it's a hard shift either way because you're giving up this old identity, you're giving up this old tribe. But um, in a sense, it's easier to go to something than to just go away from something, uh, because uh, if you just go away from it, you're on your own. And that can be it can be hard to fight those battles without the support of this new tribe. And um, yeah. religion is just one example, of course. It's true for pretty much any habit. As you join a new tribe, it's very helpful to have other people to lift you up. Yeah. Now, I, I like that example because like, I started getting really uh, keen and interested in, in, in belief development. How do we develop our beliefs? And you know, you've got like empowering beliefs and limiting beliefs. But I was like, that's not enough. I want to dig deeper. What actually makes someone like strap a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up in the name of the God they believe in or, uh, you know, why do people get so enraged with each other when one side wins in politics and the other doesn't like that? That is so deeply rooted in our system and a lot of it is unconscious. We don't know, you know, beliefs, are, beliefs definitely have a massive impact. I know Tony Robbins said that uh, every belief and value you hold 
determines the decisions that you make each and every day. Right? And so if your you tie that in with your like, habits. You can imagine it like um, like a set of glasses, you know? So like if as you rotate through different beliefs, it's like you put on a different set of glasses. Now you have the blue tinted ones on, then you have the yellow ones on and so on. And each belief system, you can see the same things, the same cues, but depending on what lenses you have on, depending on what glasses you're viewing them through, you come to different conclusions. You know, I mean, you can imagine a news station runs one story and a conservative watches it on one side and a liberal watches it on the other. And they come to very different conclusions about the same exact story that they're watching on, on the screen. So, um, in that sense, your, your beliefs are, they determine whether you see something, uh, as attractive or not the information that you come across. And that's how they influence your habits is that they, they give you a different way, sometimes positive, sometimes negative of interpreting the information that you come across in life and what you deem attractive enough to act upon or unattractive enough to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I find really useful too, and I'm sure you talk about this in your book, uh, or you've talked about it before is tying your values to your habits. So if you value, you know, keeping healthy, then you tie that to fitness, you tie it to waking up early in the morning and having a smoothie, getting proper sleep. So it just empowers and enriches that uh, habit process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is so, uh, I refer to this process as identity-based habits, but it's the idea of like you're rooting your habits in that, those core values, your principles, your identity that you want, the desired identity that you're looking to form. You know, who is the type of person that I want to be and how can those habits reinforce that? And I think it's also important, so that's on the front end, it's also important to think about that on the back end. Uh, so having a process of reflection and review and asking yourself like the habits that I've stuck to over the last year do those align with the identity that I, want, that I want to have or the values and principles that I say are important to me? So I have kind of two modes for doing that. At the end of each year, I do an annual review and uh, I just answer three questions. Um, what went well this year? What didn't go so well? And then what am I working toward? And that is just a chance for me to like track things and see like, what did I actually do? So I measure the number of workouts that I did, uh, the average number of workouts per month and uh, how that compares to the year before. I do measure the number of articles that I've written in the last year and how that compares. Um, I measure the number of places I've traveled to, uh, states and countries and so on. And, uh, and so that gives me the baseline. Then six months later, I do my second reflection review process, which is what I call an integrity report. And so the first question is, what are my core values? And so that's a chance to like revisit those, think about what are those principles. And then the second question is, how have I lived by those? So it's kind of a chance to like pat myself on the back. And then the third question is the most important one, which is where have I failed to live by those in the last year? And integrity, which I would define as just living by your values or living in alignment with your values, it, it's something that everybody thinks they have. You're not going to find anybody who says, oh, I, I don't have integrity. But the way that we get off course with it is usually not by like one grave mistake, but by a bunch of just this once exceptions that would kind of happen over time. And then you turn around two or three years later and you're like, whoa, I'm in a different place than I thought I was. Like my character and my values aren't matching up with what I think they are. And so the integrity report is kind of a chance for me to like pull myself back to center and make sure that my habits are still in alignment with my values. Yeah, that's, that's great. Have you written about this before on your website, on your blog? Yeah, so I actually publish uh, uh, both of those on the site. So you can see the annual reviews at jamesclear.com slash annual dash review. And then you can see the integrity reports at jamesclear.com slash integrity. Yeah, beautiful. And guys, if you're listening, make sure you head to James' website. He gets over 2 million views uh, a month and has over 400 and close to 450,000 subscribers on his email list. I mean, that's pretty impressive. You know, I know that what it is, is it's more than more than quantity it's quality that James puts out. So make sure you check it out. There's some really deep, well-researched content on there that James has written. So, uh, beautiful stuff, James. Thanks for jumping in, man. And, uh, I've, we're getting close to the end of this interview. Now, where can people find you online? Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, obviously jamesclear.com is a good place to go to, to start and kind of poke around and check things out. I have a lot of articles order organized by category. So based on what you're interested in, you can kind of dive in there. Um, and if you're looking for more on habits, uh, atomic habits is definitely the best, uh, and most comprehensive thing that I've put together on the subject. So, um, feel free to check that out. It's at atomichabits.com. And if you go to that page, there are, in addition to the book, 
There are some secret chapters that were not included in the final manuscript, uh, a few exercises and templates that help you implement some of the ideas in the book better, and then also uh, chapter-by-chapter audio commentary from me about like why I wrote each chapter and, and just some ideas and thoughts behind it. And um, anyway, all of that stuff is at AtomicHabits.com. Wonderful. And you're on social media, or do you stay away from it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I'm on it, but uh, you can find all that stuff at jamesco.com. It's just I got my profiles listed there and stuff. Excellent. Excellent, James. James, thanks a million for jumping on, mate. I appreciate you being a part of this and for sharing your wisdom with the Addicted to Success audience. Uh, Now, before we end this interview, I have this one last question. And this question is, if you were to deliver your last 30-second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? Your parting advice. Mm. Oh man, well, obviously such a tough question. The The answer that comes to me right now is, uh, I wrote about this recently, but I think that reading is a meta habit that influences all other habits. If you, if you read consistently, you can improve your ability to perform nearly any other habit. If you want to get better at health, you can read about working out. If you want to get better at meditation, you can read about that. If you want to get better at business, you can read about that. Pretty much any problem you're facing, uh, somebody has written something useful about it before. And so the the kind of three sentence suggestion that I would leave people with is start more books, quit most of them, read the great ones twice. 